Welcome to today's rebroadcast podcast number 50, which is titled, Join Us As We Uncover the Shadow of Adversity, with Mike from COT rebroadcasted on the End Generation Project. The original air date was March 18, 2024 on Council of Time's official website listed in the description. Join us here on End Generation Project as we explore daily excellence with renowned speakers and studying topics such as biblical eschatology, recovery from addiction, and alcoholism. We are honored to share daily wisdom from Michael, a profound Christian apologist focusing on the end times and preparedness for this inevitable time before us. For deeper insights, visit the Council of Time website linked below. Our mission extends to offering truth, hope, and recovery to those battling addiction and looking for God to call into their life. Your support drives our mission, empowering us to guide towards truth, sobriety, and readiness for the challenges ahead. Explore our local community for exclusive content. It's brand new, and it has lots of cool extras for our EG family. More about that in the description. First, a huge thank you for making End Generation Project a success. We now have 7,000 plus subscribers. We are so blessed and are very grateful. Okay, now, before we get into today's rebroadcast podcast titled, Join Us as We Uncover the Shadow of Adversity, Episode 50. Let us say that this channel is growing at a really fast rate, demonstrating the hunger that believers seek in these end generation times and their thirst for sound biblical doctrine. How fortunate we are that the Most High is utilizing us to extend our reach globally, with our content being translated into over 12 languages. As we journey together, we're committed to maintaining this podcast ad-free. Your subscription enables us to do this full-time. Please remember to subscribe, like, and message us for daily excellence in our life. We love hearing from you. There are so many fantastic stories. We love all of you. Now, time for today's rebroadcast podcast. Join us as we uncover the shadow of adversity. Now, let's get into End Generation Project's rebroadcast podcast number 50 with Mike from COT. Blessings to all. Everybody out there. You know, I'm blind at the moment. But meaning, my screens are so full and I dare not touch it because right before I was coming on air, I picked up a paintbrush by the wrong end. Never do that. Well, try to never do that. That was not too, uh, not too good. Hey, you guys that were at the midnight hour last night. We're going to schedule another one. And hopefully you guys come back. The ones that were there last time, we have something to uh, finish. A process to begin and to finish and to see you through with. That's going to become a very uh, serious thing, very involved thing. Also, uh, anybody involved in the midnight hour, make sure, guys, that you pray before having that uh, or entering into that. Because, well, guys, the spiritual assaults, as I told you guys last time, the spiritual assaults are real, right? And uh, they are permitted, but they are real, right? Satan exists. Well, just to just to get this get this out to you guys. Two things. Number one, Satan does exist, and God is allowing Satan to exist. Why do you guys think Satan exists? Why? Why didn't the Lord just do away with him? Why didn't he just, you know, jail him already? Why? Anybody know why? It's not normally as something that uh, most people won't look at, right? They, they won't really contemplate that. But it's very important that people understand. Mm -hmm. Very important. Very important. Somebody says, um, uh, what, last time we had a conversation about Satan and it kind of stopped everybody in their tracks. Because it's a real thought to have that comprehension that God is allowing Satan to exist. Satan exists because he's part of the balance. 
God provides in his honesty. God is full of truth. He's honest. The creator is honest. Our father is honest, right? So when he gives us a choice, it is not biased because it's such a serious choice. You have to have an equal measure of darkness and light. I want you guys to keep that in mind for your personal lives, too. You have to have an equal balance of darkness and light. One of the principles we're going to cover in the midnight hour is that balance of darkness and light. I'll give you one small example. In your lives, when, when, when light eases up, right? It'll ease up. Things seem to be going right. Now, anytime things start going right, it causes people a nervousness. Why? Because they know about that balance. They may not proclaim it, but they know about that balance. When things start to be trouble-free, right, it does not matter who you are. doesn't matter what your disposition is. You will have some equal measure of darkness come into your life. Now, at that time, you have to handle it. And how do you handle that equal measure of darkness? There have been plenty of times. I would design something, and it'd be perfect, right? Design something else, perfect. No real, you know, no real upsets or problems. And you know something is building, then all of a sudden, you're pressed to design something in a very short time that seems impossible. And indeed, everything goes wrong, right? Everything. Now, when things like that happen, it's up to you to make a decision. And it's up to you to handle yourselves based on either the word of God or based on your own fruition, your own method of things, right? Every time something goes wrong, your father, your father's involved, he's looking. And because it really evaluates us to see in our time of trouble, who are we in actuality? Who are we? Are we God's children or heathens? Right? Because when we handle problems in this uh, heathenistic, barbaric way, it really reveals who we are. You will never know who a person is until you see them in a time of crisis. You don't know who anybody is until a time of crisis. You better believe that that person you see in a time of crisis is who the person actually is. Many people would, would say in a conversation or something like that, they'd say, yeah. Uh, you know, I didn't mean what I said. I wasn't feeling well. Nope, that's who you are. That's who you are. And it's a blessing. It's a blessing to be in a time of trial. It's a blessing to be in a time of crisis. And you begin to act outside of your prescribed character. It's a blessing. Do you know that? Because it shows you who you are. It demonstrates what your weaknesses are. It allows you to know the real you. Many people don't know the real you. They don't know it, right? It's like wearing contacts. Anybody out there wear contacts? If you wear contacts too long, you may be convinced that's how your eyes really look. No, that's not how they look. You take those contacts out and voila, right? People have perms, correct? They do, they have perms, and but that may not be how they really are, right? If you have a perm and everybody sees your hair is curling or straight, that's not who you really are. That's not how your hair really is, right? It's not. We all know hair is based on genetics. So if your dad has hairline, you know, steel and your mom is her like wool then your hair is going to be steel wool right not straight anyway as an example sometimes we put on these uh we project to the world what we want the world to see and we start believing that we are in truth that person well the lord has his way of uncovering all of that and when we face darkness trials tribulations when we're in a moment of crisis and guess what 
it has revealed who we actually are. Anybody can act in a time of peace. You can become anybody in a time of peace. You can put up with anything in a time of peace. But when the trouble comes, that's who you really are. You are not the person everybody sees you in when it's peaceful. You're the person people see you as when everything goes wrong. The world would have you think the opposite way. Please don't do that. Because if you, if you can can really see that, you'll make the biggest changes in your life you've ever made. Right? And it will, I'm, I'm telling you, it's going to, it will cleanse your character. It really will. God deals in honesty. We are the ones that make up characters to present to the world. God is not saving some character we have made to ourselves. That's not who he's saving. That's not who he sent here to this earth. He knows exactly who he sent here to this earth. And for the most part, many of us are frightened, scared children. We are. At the core of most things, people have lots of fear in different areas. It causes them to be specific ways. Satan is allowed to oppose the word of God because he brings out these trials. God does not tempt, but Satan does. Right? God does not do evil, but Satan does. And when your trial comes, it exposes who you really are. When you see who you really are, now you know what to pray for. If God did not, if, if Satan did not exist, right, none of us would know what to pray for. Because we would not be challenged in those areas of life that we have covered over with smiles and grins and laughter. In other words, the character we have developed, we would continue to develop. God breaks through all of that, gets to the real you, and begins to, he'll raise you up beyond any character you could ever build. God sent somebody here to this earth. Who he sent here to this earth is not the person we often become. Who he sent here to this earth is uncovered when we have massive troubles, trials, and tribulations. It's not some bad thing. It's a beautiful thing. It does not feel good, right? Because it eats, it, 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 it goes right through our facade. You ever shake somebody's hand and somebody says, how are you doing? You say, I'm doing pretty good. But in truth, you're not. Anybody ever do that? Isn't that a falsehood? Isn't that living a false life? If you're not doing well, but you say you are? Hmm? What about if you embrace someone? that you never thought about. Isn't that a falsehood? And so what I'm telling you is that we often become these people who conform to society, right? We do. Because we have developed a person we want everybody to see. And the Lord cuts right through it. When Satan comes to oppose everything that we have done, and even the word of God, it forces us to surface because troubles, troubles will always reveal who you really are. But when that happens, when that happens and you find yourself in a moment of weakness, right? A real moment of weakness, now you know exactly what to pray for. You can say, Father, I'm weak in this area. I need your help. And you will receive help. But what happens if you pray for something that's not true? Well, God's not going to give you something that's based on any falsehood. Why would he respond to anything that's a falsehood? He's not. See, the truth is, we're only honest. And in that moment of honesty, when everything is going wrong, that's when we stop acting. We're not acting like we're happy. We're not acting like we're content. We're conveying true sentiment, right? And in that truth, that's our beginning. As you continue to do this, right, when trials come and you figure this out, you say, wait a minute, this is just simply the Father uncovering the truth of me that I may respond in truth to him. Once you determine that, you begin to see your trials.
And when a trial comes, when trouble comes, you'll see exactly what it is. You'll treat it differently. You'll be thankful. See, when in the Bible, when it says glory and tribulation, that sounds so strange. But I'm here to tell you, it is so true. It's very true. That's when you, when you, when you are the same on the outside as you are on the inside. Hmm? When you're honest with yourself and you begin to handle things in accordance with the word of God in honesty. God does not work in lies. He does not work in falsehoods. He doesn't do that. He will work in truth. And Lord knows we're in a time right now where many are being tried. There is so, I hate to say this, but when massive problems come to the world, start observing people to find out who they really are. Pray for them accordingly. Pray for them accordingly. In the world right now, trials are coming. Big trials. People are going to feel out of place. They're going to feel vulnerable. They're going to feel helpless. And in that moment, they will have become what they truly are. The acting will be over, right? The facade will be done in that moment. In that moment, be of help to the kingdom and those people. Meet them exactly where they are. When you see a person in weakness, take their hand in weakness and say, hey, can I help you? That's all. That's it. When you see a person, they're in crisis, and they can't, they can't really muster up enough strength to stand because they're overcome by fear. Ask them, say, hey, can I assist you? Learn to be of help in that moment of truth because it's your father who sets up every moment of truth. And every moment of truth comes with a crisis. Every moment of truth. Look in the word of God. Every moment of truth, there was a crisis. In every moment of truth, there was a crisis. Every time people were delivered, there was a crisis. All you have to do is look in the word of God, look at the historical precedence of what a crisis is. Of God's deliverance, you're going to find that they go hand in hand. Every time the crisis comes, deliverance is with it. And in that crisis, God begins the process of deliverance. Remember the death angel in Egypt? All those plagues in Egypt? That's a lot to bear. But that was the beginning of God's deliverance of his people. Wasn't it? Remember Jesus going to the cross, the opposition to the word of God? But when Jesus died on the cross and was raised from the dead, power and authority was given to the apostles, and they went out to do a real work. There are too many examples in the word of God with Elijah, the same thing. With Jeremiah, the same thing. With Israel, the same thing. The same exact thing. Crises. That's when you find out who you are. Right? Never forget this also. Why are you here? Why are we here? Now you can believe the fairy tale version of life, or you can believe God's version of life. If you're here and you believe in Christ, you are here to become sons of God. To as many as believe upon his name has he given power to become sons of God. Sons of God. Somebody says, yes, but how to help habitual liars? Every human being on earth. I challenge, I can challenge anybody, right? Let me tell you something. In the Bible it says, we were all children of wrath. Not one person who commits adultery will step foot into the kingdom of God. Not one liar is going to step foot into the kingdom of God. No fornicators. They will not step foot in the kingdom of God. In essence, anybody who breaks the Ten Commandments will not step foot into the kingdom of God. 
It is through Christ. All is forgiven and only through Christ. No matter what you have done, murder, lies, whatever the case is. People are habitual liars, period. Anybody in the flesh is a habitual liar. So let me give you an example of that. When people are doing their school thing, when they're in school, texting on the phone, right? They text plenty of people. They're going to school. They may be going to work. Do you know how many times a day people lie by text? Hey, I'm going to call you back in 10 minutes. Then you call back in 13. It's still a lie, isn't it? It's a lie, and it's habitual, because people don't mind lying like that. Why? Because it's normal behavior in society. That does not make it okay with the living God. A lie is a lie. When you don't answer the phone, when somebody calls, that's deceit, isn't it? So in essence, you have that person believe a lie that you're not there. Somehow with a cell phone. How can you not be there with a cell phone? Anyway, that's lying too. And when people do that all the time, is that not habitual? Yes, it is. Sure it is. When we embrace people in falsehoods and say, Ah, oh, how you doing? I missed you. And you didn't even think about the person. That is a habitual lie. During the holidays, when you didn't talk to somebody the entire year, with a false embrace. When you tell someone you love them, but internally you do not. When you tell someone you miss them, but internally you do not. Our responses to strangers are often lies. Oh, it was so good to meet you. And you don't even remember the person's name an hour later. See, without Christ, all of us are guilty of being a habitual liar, habitual adulterers, fornicators, murderers, thieves, you name it. Think about it. Without Christ, see, it is Satan. Satan is the one who put in the minds of people that somehow they can be equal to God, which is why people often are on this pursuit to be perfect outside of Christ. Satan put that thought in people's minds. Without Christ, we're doomed. We're not going to make it. So have that understanding. The true question is this, not to how to handle some habitual liar, but how do you approach a person who is just like you are without Christ? Because without Christ, we could not resist the temptation of sin. It is Christ who keeps us from falling, not us. Remember that. Not one of us can boast and say, well, I'm, the reason I'm not sinning is because I choose not to sin. No, Christ is the one that's able to keep us from falling. Without his power, we could not be maintained. We would fall right back into the traps of darkness. And we would be fully condemned. Do you, do you all see that? So when, when it comes to a liar or a fornicator or a thief, somebody full of covetousness, and the whole world is full of covetousness, how many times did somebody see an advertisement or somebody walking with a dress on or with a suit on or with some shoes on, they say, hey, I want that. That's, covet that's covetousness. When you look at somebody else's stuff and you develop a desire for that, that's you coveting somebody else's stuff. So you go out and get the same pair. In modern day terms, we call that marketing. Without Christ, not one of us would make it. Not one of us would be able to resist sin. Not one of us can do this on our own. Not one of us. Not one. So how do you help the worst of us in society? Christ. That's how. Keep telling you guys. I was worse than anybody I ever knew that I could ever know. I didn't even share with you guys the worst of my activities. 
And it didn't have anything to do with drugs or theft or any of those things. It had to do with the higher level, worse things. There's no compensation for it. There's no excuse for it. It simply was. No one makes it without Christ. No one. Remember that. Because if you don't remember that, you'll end up blaming or, or putting someone in a category. And if you do that, God will put you in a category. You know what the Lord said, don't you? If you judge for whatever measure you judge with, you're going to be judged. That's what the Lord said. If you don't like judgment, do not judge. The Father will handle all of it. But I'm telling you right now, all of us, all of us have fallen short in this life. All of us have failed to meet the standard of holiness. All of us. All of us. All of us have sinned repeatedly. It is God's love towards us while we were yet sinners. And he commanded his love towards us and sent his only begotten son that we could be forgiven of those vile things. We did and some people still do it right now. But even to those people who do it right now, I say, so what? You keep pressing towards Christ. People can walk around high and mighty if they want to, like somehow they got themselves out of sin. That within itself is a lie. The scriptures are clear. All who come to me, the Bible says, the Father hath given me. So if the Father did not give you to Christ, there'd be no salvation appointed to you. Remember that. It's not that we're better than anybody. Not one of us is better than that sinner out there. No, the difference is Christ. We now have the promise of life. If we finish this race, if we do not faint, if we don't fall away, I'm not one of those who will ever tell a person, well, you got to get yourself right before you start pursuing Christ. If you have a beer in your hand right now, pursue him. He is your deliverance. You pursue him with everything you are. With every problem you've got, you pursue him because he is the physician. He is the healing. You pursue him. My advice is not to listen to those who tell you, Hey, you back up. Don't say anything. Christ doesn't want to talk to you. Yes, he does. You're the very one he wants to speak to. Those of you out there who cannot overcome things, that's what he came for. Those who cannot see, he came to give you sight. We know why he came. We have to be careful. Because if we're not careful, we're going to have a pious mindset. And a viciousness goes with all those who have such a mindset. Torment is coming on this earth. Pain is coming on this earth. Everything a person fears is coming on this earth. How many hints does a father have to give us that everything is going wrong, that man attempts to run without him? Did we really think that these kingdoms in this earth would get any better without the living God? No, they're not. Do you see what's happening to all these kingdoms? They're turning into Sodom and Gomorrah every single day. They're getting worse and worse and worse, and people don't mind it. They're turning vile, repulsive. That's what's happening. And people are okay with it. My friends, you're called out of that. You're not to be mingled in with that. You're to notice that and say, thank you, Lord, for setting me apart. 
Setting you apart does not mean you don't have the ways in you, because you do. It means that you've been given an ability to choose Christ over that repulsiveness in the world. The world is degrading fast. And everything on earth will reflect it as man's iniquity rises. So are the devastations in this earth. It is my firm belief that people have not seen the great devastations to cause them to change. So they must come. There was even a time I was trying to have hope that if people saw problems in geology big enough, they would start changing. But they're not. They're getting worse. People are getting worse. And every time something happens, I say, well, we'll just, you know, build it more resiliently. We'll overcome everything that comes at us in the earth. Reminds you of the cedar tree story, doesn't it? Greater things must come. Things without comprehension. Things that surpass expectation. Horrible things. Because if they don't come, people will continue to lose themselves. In these activities in the world. Violence. Violence is darkness multiplied. Humanity against humanity. That's all I see these days. Humanity is thinking up every excuse to slaughter their brother, just like Cain and Abel. It is just like Cain and Abel. It is the old story. So the greater things must come. COVID-19, that was nothing. That was absolutely nothing. That was incredibly mild. That was nothing. And people panicked over nothing. The next plague, that'll consume hundreds of millions in torment. It will make COVID-19 seem like the sniffles. And then a plague will come that man cannot help with. And it will consume the most precious thing on this planet. Do you think people will turn? No. They'll become angry. What would happen if this world had no children at all? What would your life be like if all the children were gone? Hmm? What do you think would happen to society if not one child existed on the face of the earth? Hmm? You think people would repent? Or do you think they'd come up with some scientific reason? And why would anything have to go that far? Why would something like that have to happen? People are getting worse, and more and more people are giving in to the repulsive activities of these kingdoms. More and more people are entering into violence. They are becoming vessels of violence. Violence is no answer. Christ is. But they will not turn to Christ. Isn't it strange? How so many profess to know Christ, but they will not turn to him. Isn't it odd? Our person can say they're a Christian and they love the Lord, but they will not turn to him. 
isn't it funny? How they'll never profess Christ in view of men. Yet they say they know him. No. They're ashamed of him. And another spirit's at work. And the world's never going to see. Those spirits, they will only see the torment. They're only going to listen when everything precious to them is taken away. It's the only time they listen. It's a shame it has to come to that. But it must come to that. People will always make excuses why they cannot do better. Why they cannot stand in righteousness. They'll always excuse what they have a desire to do. We're not willing to go through anything for a breakthrough anymore. There used to be a time where people would go through all sorts of misery for somebody else's breakthrough. They would. People have forgotten what sacrifice is. People have forgotten what loving their neighbor really means. People won't sacrifice anything even for themselves, but they will excuse. What they, even us Christians, don't we continue to say, we can't stop doing this or we can't stop doing that? Don't we have an excuse for all of our sins? And we say, well, we have to, I have no power to get over them. Imagine a person, a person who did a specific drug. And this person could not get over the drug. And they knew about Christ. But they were not willing to go through withdrawal symptoms. One day this person stands saturated, their body is saturated. Their nephews come over. They touch the man and all those nephews pass away that same night. The man finds out it's due to his preparation. It passed right to the children and they overdosed and it killed them. But the man says, I just don't have enough power to stop doing it. The same thing happens to his own family. Then one day the man stands and he's lost everything. He's lost his children, his nephews, many relatives. He's standing by himself and he thinks about how much he's lost. Right when he's about to do the drug again, he throws it to the wall. Because he can't take the emptiness, the terrible thing that came through him, which was death to his entire family. And at that point, only recognizing, only when he realizes his whole family has been killed by him, does he gain power to stop doing the drugs. And the man goes through withdrawals for a month. He survives, but then when he recovers, it's too late. No celebration. No joy. Why? Because he was the vessel by which his family was lost. Why would it take all that to get a person to realize that, oh, yes, they can be free from anything. You know what the guy's failure was? Do you know what it was? His love towards his nephews and his family. It was not active. He did love them, but it wasn't active. Therefore, his reason was not strong enough.
He said, well, when he said, I can't. I can't put it down. I can't give it up. But when he lost his entire family, when the reality of losing everything he loved in his life hit him, in that moment he had power to stop. Why? Because he hurt something he loved. Listen to me. Not one soul has to wait for that. The strength you're looking for is in love itself. Not loving yourself. Not the way you understand it. Do you not know that to love yourself is to love those around you? Did you know that? Recognize everybody around you and recognize what's coming through you against them. If anything impure enters into you, it's going to come out to someone. If anything of darkness, anything meant for harm enters into you, it's going to come out to someone. Remember the love for your families. Find strength in your love for them. See, most of us, we can't do enough for ourselves. We don't have enough love for ourselves to do anything. Even I don't love myself enough to overcome things. There's no need if it's just me. But when it's somebody else, that's a different story. I'll be right back in a few minutes right here at COT, everybody. All right, guys, I'm back. Let's see. I, yeah, I'm back. You know, for, let me explain myself, guys. Can I explain myself? Because this is one of those uh, older conversations I'm having. And I guess the reason why is the more, the more you see of the world, the more you know what's coming. It is my hope that none of you are tangled up in what's coming. Right? Let me give you guys another example of something. Most of you have heard of the UFO phenomenon, right? Most of you have. People have theories on top of theories on top of theories. Correct? Would you be surprised to know that there are more than a few people that know the absolute truth about that topic? And they absolutely will never discuss it. Would that surprise you? Would it surprise you to know, right, that if you take thought of it, why or what benefit is there to coming to a world to people, right, creeping around at night and at dark and you fly a long way. Now, they're supposed to be smart. They're supposed to be advanced. They're supposed to have overcome things in society. First of all, if you fly a long distance, you have discipline. You do. Your motive is warranted, and you have discipline. You're highly purposed, or else you wouldn't do that. Correct? A lot of people are buying many different narratives about the UFO topic. There are lots of people who know the truth. One day you're going to learn that the whole UFO topic is another story. And it's not a UFO story. That story is all about you. You're going to learn that people have been falling for that story. The lie part of that story for a long time. That people hope for it. A theory. When somebody comes up with a theory, because everybody does this on planet Earth. When somebody comes up with a theory, and people begin to understand that theory, they will utilize that theory to keep people engaged, to keep them away from what's actually happening. Those things that operate outside of this reality will not suffer not one soul to disclose the truth of it. 
Anybody who tries to disclose the truth of that subject is going to be confronted by something they never thought, nor that, that they don't want to know it exists. Because the true story is being protected except for those who believe it by the Lord. The story has already been told. Most people cannot make the connection. Because they simply can't believe the whole truth yet of the Lord's word. We're not talking about anybody else's word about the Lord's word. People who try to tell that topic unprotected are torn to pieces. And their families are destroyed. Because they have no covering. Listen to me. A person without a covering from Jesus Christ cannot tell that story. They won't survive. They won't survive. Those of you who are covered, agents have gotten to you too. Those spoken about in the book of Jude have gotten to you too to make you pious, to make you look away from the story. The story of the UFOs is the story of the opposition in the earth against humanity. but not the way you may like. I'll give you a small example of a truth, not theory. And I'm telling you right now, people will not agree with this. Most folks will not agree with it. There's a reason why these spheres, these balls, show up and then disappear into nothingness. It has nothing to do with technology. Everything to do with the general nature of deception itself. A long time ago, even in Genesis, when it says there were Nephilim in the earth before the flood and also after that, where do you think they went? I'll tell you where they went. If the flood came to destroy, what? Does anybody know what the flood came to destroy? Because it did not destroy all the Nephilim in Genesis 6. It didn't. Because right in Genesis 6 you read there were Nephilim before the flood and also after that. So if the flood came to destroy all the Nephilim, it did not work. God had already decreed there were Nephilim before the flood and also after that. So the flood came to destroy the abominations in the earth. The things that human DNA and animal DNA and all the other DNAs were connected with, correct? Hmm. Well, let's get down to the truth here. First and foremost, if a dark spirit were to enter into any of you and to stay, your body would begin to change. Parts of your body would stretch, other parts would contract. Spiritual entities are an authority within themselves. That's why they appear to do all these supernatural things. They are an authority themselves. If one were to enter into a person, that person's body would begin to conform to the spirit. So the person's face might contort. Their looks may be different. Their eyes may change. All sorts of things may happen. Something is going to be off about the person. And when they're free from the spirit, their body is going to go back to whatever it was. But when they're in a person, and that person has agreed to have them in them, their body is going to start shifting. Back in the days of old, the Lord told us about these things, these fallen angels, who made it with women. They became one. And the women produced giants, number one. Mighty men of renown, number two. Right? Not just giants, but men of renown. Great men, kings, queens. But also, they tampered with the animals. That's why I grieved God that he made man. Because man was totally corrupted. 
And it was no longer man, it was something else. And they were running all throughout the earth, consuming the acquisitions of men, causing a great imbalance. That's where you read the myths about these great kingdoms and these weird things that used to exist in the earth a long time ago. That's where it comes from. Not the Pathion. No, not that. But the other stories about the tribes that have been in the earth. That's where it comes from. So the flood came to destroy the abominations, the mixture, the offspring between angels and human beings. So what about fallen angels themselves? A flood cannot kill a fallen angel. A flood can't do that. But we do know it grieved God that he made man. We do know that. They corrupted everything. These things corrupted everything. Listen, and God looked upon the earth and behold, it was corrupt for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. Animals were no longer doing what they were designed to do, made to do. Human beings were no longer doing what they were made to do. They altered the course of humanity. The fallen angels did. They alter the course of humanity. They alter the course of human beings, of animals, of fish. Hmm? Listen, and behold, I, even I, do bring a flood waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life from under heaven, and everything that is in the earth shall die, he said. Where is the breath of life? Everything that had the breath of life was going to die. God gave you the breath of life. He didn't give an angel the breath of life. That's for us. That's for animals here. That's for this realm. But everything in this realm that was corrupted had to die. Why? Angels cannot reproduce. But we can, and so does life on this earth. It reproduces. Angels do not reproduce. So if man is corrupted, if animals are corrupted, they will reproduce corruption. Everything they re they're, they're going to reproduce, repopulate the earth, but everything would be corrupted and it would not be God's way. It would be a corrupted way upon the earth. So then God set forth to destroy the earth by the floods. Listen. The earth also was corrupt before God. The biggest hint right here, and the earth was filled with violence. That means prior to this time, the earth was not filled with violence. They are the ones. They are the ones who are causing what you see today. That's why people hate the book of Enoch, because it shows how the fallen educated mankind, and as mankind was educated Prior to their ability to handle the knowledge, all it produced was war and violence and corruption in the earth. Just like right now. And people are returning to violence. So God destroyed everything that had the breath of life in the earth. Some of those things that were roaming around did not have the breath of life. Right? And some still existed before and after the flood. Nephilim. Right? Nephilim. But mankind was severely limited. Now when this happened, many went underground. Others went into the heavens. They were escaping. There are so many stories in the ancient world. So many stories that say the exact same thing. That those star serpents, they call them, people who are Native American, you know, they call them sky serpents, and they call them the, the people that were in the ground, they call them the ant people. But the star serpents went back to the stars. They told the people a calamity was coming. They went out into the heavens, but they would return. Those other ones went into the earth. They tried to save their respective tribes. I want you to think of something. 
Think of a species that God did not create that tried to help their own offspring. One thing in the book of Enoch, anybody will notice, is how the fallen angels loved their corrupted children. Now, their children would destroy humanity, rule over them, do cruel things to them, right? But they also had enjoyable times, too, just like the kingdoms we live in. We live in a very cruel world. All of you have been under the thumb of cruelty at some point in this world. You know how cruel it can be. But if you start to conform to the world and begin to operate within the rules of the world, it is not so cruel to you. All of us know this. Same thing happened back then. So they took those tribes favorable to them, and they saved many tribes of the earth, some in the grounds and some in the heavens. After the flood and everything was settled, they began to come back. The people did. The fallen had always appointed the, these angels, right? These angels, not the ones that are bound, but the other ones said that they would come back at an appointed time. But they would be doing something in the meantime. That's also in the book of Enoch. How they would also produce inhabitants of the earth that were not God's design. They would be inter mingled with mankind. Their teachings would then ultimately corrupt mankind again, and man would become highly violent. They would go through the 70 priests, through the seven, 70 errors of time. And then the Lord would cause his fulfillment at the end. The 70 priests they would preach a specific thing. This would happen for 70 increments in the earth. All of what's in the book of Enoch is happening is incredible. But what you don't know is that all those cities that were here above ground, many of those cities were covered up by dirt. Some were reestablished. Many were reestablished underneath your feet. We can't exist in lava. We can't do that. We're in the wrong form. We carry the breath of life. Other things can. Where nobody can touch them. They exist in places where nobody can touch them. The earth is almost eaten away inside. It's cavernous. Extremely cavernous. Extremely cavernous. Part of the reason for harp. And the reflectivity of the atmosphere was to get, was to acquire some good images of the earth through a radioactive substance, which would show the caverns in the earth. And when the pictures came back, my goodness, nobody had it right. Nobody did. Think of the earth as us living on the top layer, right? If you hold your finger, if you hold... If you were to hold a basketball, the ground that we live on outside that basketball is the width of a human hair. That's with the mountains and everything. Think about that. The width of a human hair. The width of a human hair. So there are many different, right? You can stack human hairs on top of each other, and you have a lot of regions that go up about 50,000 feet in between. Lots of things can live in these places. In fact, it's a known fact that in the earth, there are many countries like Peru who shut off those cavernous systems because people were dying and children would go missing. And every time those caverns were opened, people would begin to explain the same things they did many thousands of years ago. So why is it all around the world they took these entrances? And they put concrete over them. 20, 30, 40 feet of concrete. Not inches, feet of concrete. Who would do that? But they did. It was the only way to save themselves from what kept coming through. And every single case, they would say children would be missing. Right now, you live in a world today where the influence of these things is all over the place. You know more about the influence of the fallen than you think you do. The ways of this world are established in the fallen ways. 
not the holy ways. That's why there's this rip, there's this tear between the world and the living God. That's why Jesus said to love this world is to have enmity with God. Because if you love this world, you love the deeds and the fruit of, you guessed it, the fallen. That's why they, they're not relatable to each other. Satan will often copy God, but he has no fulfillment in righteousness. Now, these older things that live in the outskirts of man underneath your feet, who are not protected, who do you think came up with a message of saving the earth? Hmm? What do you guys think came up with a message of saving the earth? Did we go off air? We did. Are you serious? Are you guys on channel zero? <laughs> I can see the interruption. That's external. Well, it looks like that's tower one. All right, everybody on Mixler, stand by. See, you know, we could talk about any. Can you guys still hear me on channel zero? You guys give me some confirmation if you can hear me on channel zero. If anybody can hear me on channel zero, let me know. Channel zero is good. Yeah. Well, I can't tell you how channel zero works, but thank God it is not. It doesn't work like anything else. Now, this is strange. You ready for this? The, one of the towers that we have is a standard system, right? And it has it has an overvolt condition right now. Uh, you can't have an overvolt condition on a passive antenna that's not powered at the moment. So that means around it, right? The voltage went up around it. Ambient conditions around it are up. And of all the times it would interrupt this conversation, when you get down to the nitty gritty, let me collapse, let me condense the point I'm making on that. And tell everybody in Mixler, I'm going to be right back. Can you guys do that? Tell everybody in Mixler, I don't really want to say anything until I get back. Lord have mercy. Thank you, Lord. Though. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm still here, not dead yet, so we're good to go, right? Mixler is going to be back on in a minute. If you guys could tell everybody that Mixler is going to come back on in a minute. I will attempt to slide them over to the... Uh, see, this is why I'm going to have to get... Uh, I'm going to have to... I need a plan. A plan of attack. That's what I need. Plan of attack for 2024. I believe we can have it. We I can have it. But I can tell you right now, it's it's, uh, it's going to take, uh, I'm going to have to probably have to go into some things. That personally, I don't want to do. I don't want to do it. But I may do it anyway. Just to ensure that our uh, autonomy continues, right? Just to ensure that. Because that was opposition, people. I can't put that to you any other way. That was opposition. Again, you can't get an overvolt condition on a passive radio mass. It's not being powered yet. Which means that power came from an external source. At any rate, we're going to continue with our discussion here. What time is it? Yeah, for, for a few minutes anyway, because uh, problems when, when things like this happen, right? When things like this happen, for the most part, interruptions, if they be of a spiritual origin, these interruptions happen to test your patience to get you off track of what you were talking about right if you're ever compromised 
by your own emotions, you're likely not worthy to tell up that subject. Does the Lord allow this to happen? Yes, he does. And if you lose your cool, right, then you can, you can almost be guaranteed that your, your information flow is going to be severely interrupted, right? Could this be an attempt? Of course, it's an attempt of the, of, uh, any foe out there that's not like this information. But, okay, we got Mixler's back on again. So I'm going to give it a few minutes to warm up here. It'll warm up. Well, let's see how long that one holds. Hopefully it'll do uh, a lot better there. Guys, it's important that uh, we use what we use. Um, we tried pure internet before, and it will not work. It won't work. It doesn't matter what device, uh, what device is utilized. It does not matter. It won't work. And so we have some hopping alternatives that we do. Okay. Anyway, things that have been held back from all of us for a long time, like those things in the bombless pit at an appointed time. That barrier is going to be taken away. And every single soul on planet Earth that is not sealed will be tormented. Every single person who is not sealed will be tormented. As by Revelation you read, the word says... You know, don't touch any green thing or any tree or anybody who has the seal of God in their foreheads. And that pit opens. That protection era of grace and mercy is gone. It's going to be gone. This is the time, and that's just an explanation of something all of you need to know, because it did not name the number of those things that will be loosed from the bottomless pit. And when it happens, there is no going back to party time. Somebody says in the Old Testament, when someone saw the Lord's angels, they fell face down. How will we be able to know the difference between the Lord's angels and the fallen ones? Because the fallen angels will seduce you. They'll drag you away. Listen to me very carefully. Don't think it's going to be like Hollywood. Please don't think it's going to be like Hollywood that somehow that the bad angels are going to be severely ugly. People have already encountered the fallen. And they love it to pieces. The fallen angels are seductive at their core. Do you hear me? Look, look at this world. Look at the music industry. You have half naked people up there. Speaking and conducting themselves in absolute seduction to draw you by way of the flesh to keep looking, to keep partaking of it. That's how darkness works. It seduces. That's one of the key characteristics of the Jezebel spirit. It seduces. It seduces. It seduces the servants of God to commit fornication, to mingle the Holy Word of God with everything else. The Jezebel spirit, while many people truly honestly believe it has something to do with the sexual nature of humanity, let me tell you something. That Jezebel spirit will have you mix the holy word of God with unholy doctrines and come up with some new theorized proposal for somebody else that will do nothing but deceive. 
did we not learn the lesson of the fallen angels, how they mixed the design of God with their own design. And that is called an abomination. When the gospel of Jesus Christ is defined by writings of Zechariah's ascension, that is an abomination. That's what Jezebel does. Je Jezebel does that to a doctrine. The fallen angels did that to human vessels. And those fallen angels who did that to human vessels were bound and will never be free. Satan is not bound. Why not? Because he didn't cross that line. Did you notice the ones who crossed the line, who actually corrupted flesh, they were bound never to be released. Jezebel, she's running around. Why? Why? Why did God not bind Jezebel? Because it's our choice to accept the corruption or not. But when you corrupt humanity and you corrupt God's design and his way by way of the flesh, you're forcing your way upon others. Now you're putting everybody in a compromise because you're not to kill your brother. See that? They had to be bound. They crossed the line. When you bring that junk into this realm, into this reality, and people don't have a choice, you've crossed the line. Jezebel, the demons, even Satan, they do things by doctrine. And all of the ways of fallen angels produce what? All of these hybrid doctrines, these abominations, they produce violence. The entire key word I wanted you guys to see in Genesis 6, 11, the earth was corrupt before God and the earth was filled with violence. So the end result of an abomination is violence. Violence. God's word does not produce violence. Jesus does not produce violence. Satan does. Wherever you see violence, that is the fruit of of darkness itself, violence, anger. You know, violence, it begins by anger. Anger is a manifestation of violence. Do you know that? Anger is just a simple manifestation of violence. That means violence is within the vessel who would become angry. They just did not act fully on it yet. Violence is the fruit of an abomination. An altered way of the living God. In this earth, the end result is an abomination. Which produces the fruit of violence. 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 Somebody says, is sex in marriage, is sex in marriage from God? You don't want my views on that. You don't want my views on that. Probably best you get that from somebody else. You don't want my views. I'll tell you why. Because I find the ways in this earth disgusting. Nothing but disgusting. Half these thoughts, ways, methods, and everything else are born purely of lust. And I've seen the three entities of lust. And I won't, I'm, I'm an eternal enemy of lust itself. And things born of lust, I can easily see. You don't want my opinion in that. I'm an enemy of lust. God gave man the ability to create life. Man put his own twist on it. Intimacy between a man and a woman should be pure, not full of thoughts sewn in by a myriad of lustful things. There's a difference between lust and love. 
And in these days, most things are based on lust. And just like animals, many give in to it. Just like animals. I don't agree with most of these folks who would dare to have the mind of the living God to tell someone why he made something. I do not share those are heathenistic thoughts, arrogant, prideful thoughts. People say many things for self-advantage. So I'm no good at that. I disadvantage myself when I open my mouth. Haven't you noticed? Does man have to see this entire process? Yes, he does, or man will not turn. The thickness of the doctrines in the world that are corrupted and continue to corrupt us so thick, sometimes so inescapable. And the children born into a reality that's based on a corrupted doctrine, they'll never be able to see that their whole life is based on a corrupted doctrine. They'll never be able to see it. If all of us right now were in fact born in the age of the beast, how would we ever recognize the beast? We wouldn't. You know what we would say? Oh, that stuff is coming, but it's not here yet. In fact, everybody would say that. Until God judges, they would say, well, that stuff is coming, it's not here yet. They would overlook their own time. Because they'd be so used to the corruption in the world that they wouldn't be able to see it. But I'll tell you something, when you take a step back and you immerse yourself in the word of God and you do so in truth and then when you look up from that word to the world, you see nothing but abominations. You see conversations of abominations. You see arguments and debates based in abominable things. You see approved acts of abominations, a society that embraces and loves abominations. You see murders and thefts taking place all the time, and it seems no one cares. You see greed and envy and lust and all sorts of things being exercised. And people love it to be so. You see the earth totally upside down. And holiness is trampled underfoot. That's what you see. People make excuses for flesh. Who's going to make some sort of statement towards holiness? Even in the natural nature of man, it has been corrupted. The natural way of man has been corrupted, and now it's in the animal kingdom again. Until you take yourselves out of the world, you'll never see the world for what it is. You won't see it. You'll just simply be a partaker of this world. Once you stop partaking of the world and immerse yourself in the word of God, then you begin to see what the world truly is. It is already. It is already. In the flames. And the people are willfully ignorant of the truth. And more people fight for the flesh than they do for the word. They already worship the dragon and all the works of the dragon because they cannot see it for being the dragon. But they clearly worship the works of their own hands. Don't they? And 
now the heavier things come. Not for those who are lost in the world, but for you. If the Lord does not bring what he's about to bring, you would lose your stamina. You would lose your resiliency. You wouldn't be kept. Don't you all know that there's a fine line right now that exists. And all of you, you know about this fine line I'm about to say. It is the fine line of keeping your faith and being enthusiastic about it or losing all hope, thinking time is going to continue forever. You know that's being hot or cold. And how many times has a person who believed in Christ felt as though their situation was going to last forever when they looked at the world and it looked like their sufferings in the world would continue for a long, long, long time? How many times has a person who believes in Christ lost hope because of that? Now at this point, God's people, they're skeptical. If anybody says a great event is coming, they're skeptical. You know why? Because they really want that great event to come. Because they really want to be reunited with the Lord because they too can see what the earth truly is. But they cannot profess it lest they become an outcast. You see, because God's people, they understand the consequences of siding with the Lord in view of people. They know what the consequences are. And to this very day, many are not willing to endure those consequences. Willingfully, they're not. So people search so they can be reassured. How would one overcome that dilemma? Easy. Very easy. One day, I quit thinking about time altogether. I don't think about time anymore. I don't think about how close we are, how distant we are. I don't think about that. I have a different quest, you could say. See, I know the words of the Lord are real. I've seen too many things demonstrated. I have a desire to walk in a way that most think is impossible. I have a desire to live a way that most believe to be impossible. I do not think it's impossible. I have a strong desire to achieve it. Not to stand out, because I'll do so in secret if necessary. But it will be my life. To walk in the Lord's absolute truth, not some man-made interpretation of truth, no. But in absolute full faith, I want nothing proven to me. I don't need great signs or small signs, miniature signs. I don't need any sign. I don't need any proof, any demonstration. I don't need those things. I want to believe wholeheartedly in a desert where nothing is confirmed. Honor Christ in a fullness most don't have the stomach for. And I want to live by faith, not by sight. But I don't think about time. I don't think about suffering, mishaps, all the things that most people do. And I found something very interesting. The more you let go of those things, time, When is the Lord coming? When is he not coming? All these different things, the more the Lord shows you. 
the more he allows you to see. Then he'll begin to show you a multitude of work that is almost absolutely impossible for any one person to do. That's when the souls of men become the single most important thing in your life. Because again, in a world of darkness, how would one know it's dark? The characteristics of holiness are clear. They're also not abundant in these days. Even leadership has separated from the authority of the living God. They have all but banished Christ. And they operate more from perversions than anything else. In this world, they uphold the murderer and they seek to slay those who would protect life. If that continues, the Lord's people can easily be sucked into it. So the Lord will send for his own people an alarm, an eye opener. So that his people will not perish. Because if the Lord does not, if he does not, even the very elect will be deceived. Sound familiar? If God does not intercede, even the very elect will be deceived because they too will begin to believe the falsehoods promoted by this world and the growing false power that many see as authentic. Hmm? Without Christ, all is lost. He must do what he has to do for the sakes of those who believe upon his name. Because if he does not, there's no hope for anybody. Hmm. That's why he will intercede. That's why. That's why he promised he'll never leave us nor forsake us. These are the heavy days. These are very dark days. So I hope that all of you are ready. Because it will not be in favor of any of us. But it will be very necessary for us. Somebody says, are we possibly the elect? The elect are those who believe upon his name. And if it were possible, even the very elect would be deceived. Why is it not possible? Because of Christ. Because of his intercession. Not because of the elect. If not for Christ, the elect would be absolutely, totally deceived. But the intervention of Christ is the only reason the elect are not deceived. Do you see, do you see how hopeless it is without Christ? There is no hope for a person without Christ, no matter what they think themselves to be. Without Christ, there is no hope. And how were the very elect deceived? By the miracles that were being done by a false power in this earth. You know what? People are drawn to magnificent things. Maybe that's why authentic vessels of the living God do not do miracles in public. Maybe that's why the real breakthroughs are happening in private, not in public. 
Because when you read the New Testament, you see that the Antichrist and those with the spirit of Antichrist are the ones working miracles. That's what you see. What about the miracles for the church? The Lord said, do your good deeds in secret that your Father may reward you openly. Anybody who possess the authority of healing through Christ would not do so openly. But they would obey the word of God. And by the call of holiness, it would be an intimate healing and a true healing not to be publicized. But that the Lord would be glorified in truth. A doctor who has a successful surgery is nervous throughout the entire operation. So they don't brag when it's over. They're thankful that it worked. They're thankful that the person lives. They don't go out and advertise it. Why? Because they did it for the other person. When you do something for yourself, that's when you start telling everybody. But when you do something for someone else, you don't go telling everybody. When it's authentic, you don't say anything about it. You're simply thankful. You're simply thankful that you were the vessel it came through. When real works are done like that, there's no media. There's no marketing. Because it was for real. When you give your loved one a real embrace, you don't go and tell everybody, I just hugged my so-and-so. That's not what you do. Why? Because it's intimate. Because it's real. Whenever you do something real like that, you keep it a secret. You don't advertise it. Because it's real. But when something is fake, when something has an, another purpose connected to it, then you advertise. For example, if somebody said, did you apologize to so-and-so? And you say, oh. Then you go and hug so-and-so and you come back and tell everybody, yeah, I gave so-and-so a hug. Because you want it to accomplish something external from the actual deed. You want them to know and to believe that somehow you've forgiven that person through the embrace. So you're utilizing the activity to accomplish something. But when you do something intimately, you're not utilizing that activity to accomplish something. You're doing something for somebody else. And in that moment, you're full of sacrifice. You're not going to advertise it. You're not going to market that. You're not going to go tell that on the mountain. a mother feeds their child, do they go out on their front or back porch or, or front door and go yell out to the world, I just fed my child. That's not what they do. They don't do that, do they? When something is real, it's rarely told. When it's real, it's not marketed. When somebody markets something, it carries what they did is to accomplish something else. You can't see. Usually, that's the way it works. So then the Lord gave us good advice. Do your good deeds in secret that your Father may reward you openly. Be authentic and real behind what you do. Folks, you get the message. You do. There's so many things forming right now. Constant threats. Constant military buildup. Constant eruptions. Sure, we know about those things. 
It's what comes next. It's not a mystery. No, it's called torment. To date, the inhabitants of this world have been protected. The Lord must intervene. Now the consequences. They will come. Hmm. And you are here for an authentic work. All of you are here for an authentic work. A work for people. Not to promote, but an authentic work, the real deal. Your vessel is marked for real habitation of the Holy Spirit. Not for show, for real. That requires a surrender. A real surrender. But not some surrender modeled after what people do publicly. No. 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 A surrender is when you are no longer chasing what you have designed. That's when you're willing to put down your path and take up another. Hmm? When you take up that other path, those who have done this, they know what's on that path. Those who have not done this, it is for you to discover what's on that path. Because what's on that path is what you long for internally. That never goes away. There's a yearning in you that will never go away until you find it. And the only way to find that is to be on that right path. But that's up to you to take it or not. But the Lord is, the Lord does an authentic work. And all of you who believe upon his name, you're marked for that authentic work in this time. You live in a very different time. The barrier is almost gone. When it's gone, the night comes. When the night comes, no man can work. Nobody can work in the night. So work while it's day. And do your best. Do your absolute best. I saw somebody asking about the KD files. We have forward motion. Let's hope it continues. Listen, guys, sometimes with everything in COT, sometimes things will slow down. We live in very challenging times, don't we? Right? This is a, is a collect, COT is a collective thing. It's a collective thing. And collectively, sometimes, well, things slow down. Right? But we'll get there. This is a, just take note. COT is for everybody. Right? It's not a site where one person runs it and, and then, no, it's not that. It stays up forever. It's full of software. Right? It's for, the, it's for those involved with the kingdom. It's for ministries. It is. That's what it's for. You guys don't, don't, you guys don't have to put that donation thing up there. Sometimes when you prompt for a donation, right? It just seems too orchestrated. I, I just have to tell you that here in COT, right? I like authentic things. I like the Lord's work. I do. And here's what that means. Why did someone have to mention anything for someone else to do what the Lord has put in them? I like things when they're done, when the Lord puts something in someone. It is indeed a true work. It really is. It's a true, it's an upright work. That's what I, I enjoy that. I like that. Because I'll tell you something spiritually, the Lord can do more with a with 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 five dollars, 
right? Given in, in with the spirit than with a million dollars given with some grudge or something else. There's always something connected to whatever's given. Always. Always, always, always. You know how people say, well, you know, I, I, I heard one person say they take dirty money. Too. I don't want anybody's dirty money. I don't want anybody's money. You, you don't take away from your families to give to COT, right? Nope, you don't. That's out of order. That's totally out of order, right? Even the Lord told us to give of our increase. You know what that means? Your increase is above and beyond what you owe. It's important that all of you be out of debt. That's important. You see how that balance is? Now, that's holiness. That's the order of the Lord, not man's greed. If spiritually. If you give a hug, give it spiritually. In other words, give it in truth bound with God's love to someone else that it may be affected. Don't give out of guilt. Don't do anything out of guilt. Do all of what you do out of love, uprightness, honesty, with a purpose of holiness for the person. If you can't do something for the person, don't do it. Do not do it. Don't do it. Let everything you do be bound in a brightness to that. COT is collective, right? So based on how we move forward collectively, then there we are. We'll go forward or not. Either way, we do what we can do today, right? We do what we can do from day to day. I'm not, this is not like any other organization out there. Well, maybe some are like that, but I wouldn't recommend anybody operate like this. I wouldn't. I believe in faith. In spiritual things heavily I do it's costly in this world when you walk and live like that it is costly because you don't live your life like everybody else but I'd rather have the water in the well Right? Than the money for the well. Does that make sense? I'd rather have the fresh word than all the beautiful fixtures. I'd rather have a useful word than all the perks. So I won't compromise in that way. Do whatever you do spiritually. Does COT have needs? You better believe it. But let the Lord communicate that to you. There's a part of you that already knows. Just be careful not to listen to lies. We're still having people saying they gave to COT and it didn't even go to counciloftime.com. So you guys keep that in mind, right? Now, there are people out there giving to other sites, not even YouTubes, but other sites. And then they come here saying, well, how did that donation help? I'm sorry, we didn't get that. Right? Nothing is disclosed. Right? But all dollar figures are accounted for. They're perfectly accounted for. They're self-updating. They are. That's how you know when the spirit is, how the spirit is moving, right? That's how you know the crooks out there too. Since the beginning of the year, let's see, since the beginning of the year, we've gone 86% down. 86%. There's your truth. That's what you wanted to know, so now you have it, right? We'll get the rest sorted out. Folks, God bless each of you. I'm going to join you all next time. We'll get back on track with Revelation, yes. I don't know why I took this route this evening, but I did. I trust it will help someone. I, I certainly do hope it does. Somebody says, uh, what would you say about the vault dates? Speaking of vault dates, you probably don't want to see those either. Let me see. 
Are there any specific related to the KD files data vault dates? Yes. And there are 32 dates to put up there to post. These have explanations. Listen to me on these dates. Some of these dates are scientific. With an, they're going to be marked with an S, and that means they've been deduced out of actual movements in the heavens and the, in the earth and, you know, all these different things. Some are different. Those I'm going to leave open. If the Lord gives me something, I'll tell you something. When the Lord gives me something versus with the scientific instruments, believe it or not, what the Lord has given me has never failed. But the observations with scientific instruments have failed. Right? They've been off. What the Lord gives is never off. I'm going to make a distinction between the two so that you guys can see it yourselves. But any of those things the Lord gives me, when I put those dates up there, there's something associated with the dates. For example, there were a couple of times I called up municipalities to speak with, uh, to get to know individuals, to tell them of certain things. See, I just don't put a date up there. But there are places associated with these dates, and then I have to take that a step further and talk to folks in certain places, right? Uh, to speak to people about certain things, I'll put it that way. And all that's given spiritually. So it, it's just not a date slammed up there because something may happen. No, there are things associated with those dates. Action is taken behind them, which is why I post them in the first place. Right? But credibility is going to be critical for those who may not have the faith you do. They may not know me like you do. And they're not going to understand how anybody can forecast anything solar three months before it happens or, you know, something months before something happens. They won't comprehend how that's taking place, right? And it's important that people truly understand that the Lord provides in many different ways. And he brings things together, right? For the edification of the church, not edification of the person, but of the church. Right? Of the church. Somebody said, so sorry, Michael, the Lord will keep you and never fails. I'm glad you brought this to our attention. I've seen this happening three years now. And when I commented, they, oh, delayed the post and souls. That's okay. Anyway, so all that stuff is associated with things for the body of Christ, right? Not not just for randomness and this, that, and the other, but it's also for credibility. If somebody ever goes back and looks at some of the things that you're about to see on COT, right? They're not going to be altered. They're going to stay the same. And when people go in there and look, they'll be able to see. But most importantly, these things are cataloged. So it's going to absolutely help somebody in the future with something they may be looking into, there are going to be people out there looking for the word of God where the word of God can't be found. Who's going to have a record, uh, kind of like a journal of daily things that have been happening that led up to an event to give a person the understanding of why there are hardly any people left in the earth. All right. Have you guys ever thought of yourselves after certain events take place according to Revelation? Who's going to sow into the lives of those people? Who? I know that we are. We will. We're going to soar into the lives of those we cannot speak to today. Somebody will surely come. There are people out there right now, they don't even know about COT. They might find themselves in trouble. God may lead them to a certain location or place. And then there you go. But that happens when you're obedient. So it's important that I be obedient. And it takes something to go out on a limb when nobody else will. It does. Everything's at stake. You guys do understand that. You go out there like Willy Wonka brain and put a date out there that, that you know nobody's dumb enough to put out there. You're putting everything on the line. When you do things by faith, because the Lord gives you guys things too. Here's the difference. You know that if you put something out there and it does not come to pass, you're going to be the you're going to be the one that everybody's going to, but see, I'm willing to take that risk. I really am. I'm willing to take a risk that everybody point at me and say, idiot, you know, or false person or whatever the case, whatever they do. I'm willing to take that risk. So long as the will of God is accomplished, people can say what they want. 
But what the Lord gives will never fail. Never will it fail. It may be misunderstood, but it will never fail. And I'll say it again. God has given many of you things. You're just frightened of the repercussions if it doesn't take place. Right? There have been times in your life that God gave you something you didn't tell a soul. And then when it took place, you said to yourself, I should, I should have told somebody something because the Lord gave this to me and I did nothing with it. Hmm? So I'm not the only one. I'm not the only one. And every time somebody on the outside, when they see these things and they come to pass, do you not understand what it does to that person? In most cases, it gives that person enough faith to say, huh, uh, something, there's, I don't know what it is, but there, there, there's, these things with the Lord are real. And it gives them enough faith to go back to their Bibles with a new sense of hope. It does. Don't be afraid if the world points. They're going to point at you whether you do something or not. Haven't you noticed? Hmm? They're going to blame you whether you say it or not. Just be obedient. But we are putting explanations right beside the... Uh, but that's what the vault is for. The vault is a breakdown of what it is, especially now that we're dealing with uh, the noises again. You guys do realize the noises are coming back, right? The noises are going to begin again. The noises in the heavens, the loud noises that everybody hears, they're going to begin again. They're going to be a bit louder this time, but they're going to begin again. <clears throat> We'll get to all that, though. Hey, I'm going to say God bless all of you guys. Listen, I'm going to see you tomorrow. If at any time the player turns on at midnight, that'll be a midnight hour. All right. Sometimes they're not going to be scheduled. They're going to be, they're just going to happen. Okay. If you happen to be up around midnight and the player turns on, that means we're having a midnight hour. It'll work like that. They have to be somewhat spontaneous and spiritually directed. Okay. You have to really be spiritually directed. But uh, if that player turns on, it's midnight hour. And anybody, everybody is welcome. With that, guys, I'm going to say God bless each of you. I'm going to see you guys next time right here at COT. And Flash, answer that question about the nines. But I'll see you guys next time right here at COT. God bless. 